Hi, my name is Oliver Bacon. I'm an HIV and infectious disease doctor in San Francisco. And I'm going to talk to you today about extragenital screening for gonorrhea and chlamydia in MSM, or men who have sex with men. And I'm doing this on behalf of the California Prevention Training Center. This is a roadmap of what we're going to talk about today. So we're going to introduce a patient. We're going to talk about the reasons for screening. We're going to talk about the CDC screening guidelines, current screening practice and how we're doing, things you can do to make it easier to screen, some treatment guidelines, particularly updates since uh, 2015, and then what to do with our patient. OK, so this is Jeremy. He's 21. He's here for a routine health exam. He feels well. From his chart, you know he's in good health. He did have gonorrhea two years ago. You ask him, do you have sex with men, women, or both? And he gives you a blank stare. So you try again. You say, do you ever have sex with men? And he says, yes, but doesn't volunteer a whole lot more detail. Uh, you know from his chart that he's been vaccinated for hep A and hep B. So you want to screen him. Why would you screen? So there are a number of reasons to screen. One is you'll find diseases, and you can treat them and prevent ongoing morbidity. Two, treating an incident STD reduces transmission, and we know that there are explosive rates of STDs in men who have sex with men. Three, we know that having a bacterial STD is associated with incident HIV infection and should prompt an HIV test. And finally, we know that diagnosing someone with an STD identifies someone who might benefit from pre-exposure prophylaxis or PrEP. OK, so I'm going to talk a little bit about rising rates of STDs in San Francisco. These are rates of gonorrhea, chlamydia, and early syphilis in men who have sex with men in San Francisco between 2007 and 2013. And you can see a steady upward trajectory, particularly in gonorrhea and chlamydia. I put PrEP there in 2012. That's when PrEP or pre-exposure prophylaxis really appeared in some measurable fashion in San Francisco. And you can see that rates of these STDs were increasing before PrEP hit the streets. Uh, and I say that because PrEP has often been blamed in the popular press for rising rates of STDs. But we know they were rising before PrEP arrived. OK. In particular, today, we're going to talk about rectal chlamydia, rectal gonorrhea, and pharyngeal infections. And you can see that those have been on the rise concomitantly uh, with overall rates of these STDs. OK, so I said before that having a bacterial STD is associated with HIV risk. And he, you can see that from this slide. So if you had rectal gonorrhea or chlamydia, your risk of being diagnosed with HIV in the following year was 1 in 15 if you were man who had sex with men. Contrast that with a 1 in 53 risk in MSM who did not have rectal gonorrhea or chlamydia. That calculus changes a little bit with the arrival of PrEP. These are data from the Kaiser San Francisco PrEP Clinic. And you can see that despite high rates of STDs in 500 person years of PrEP use, 50% of patients were diagnosed with any STD, including 33% with rectal gonorrhea, but none of them were diagnosed with HIV. So if you identify a patient who has a rectal STI and put them on PrEP, you erase that increased risk for HIV acquisition. So because of data like these, the CDC has included diagnosis of a rectal gonorrhea or chlamydia infection as a reason for recommending PrEP to your patients. So these are the screening guidelines for STDs among MSM. They include HIV testing, syphilis serology, testing for gonorrhea and chlamydia in the urine, in the rectum, and in the pharynx, at least annually. Testing frequency should be increased for patients who have multiple or anonymous partners who have partners who have multiple or anonymous partners, or who use drugs. 
In those situations, testing every six months or even every three months is recommended. OK, so how are we doing following these guidelines? So among MSM, what percentage of gonorrhea or chlamydia infections do you think would be missed if you only were to test the urine? And if you guessed more than 70%, you'd be correct. So these are data from the STD surveillance network looking at rates of screening by site. And you can see, and these are in MSM, and you can see that we do pretty well screening for gonorrhea and chlamydia in the urine. We don't do as well screening in the pharynx or in the rectum, which is a problem. <laughs> because you can see from these figures that as much rectal gonorrhea was detected as urogenital gonorrhea. And in fact, when we talk about chlamydia, more rectal chlamydia was diagnosed than urogenital chlamydia. So in summary, urethral screening alone misses a lot of disease. Over 70% of extragenital gonorrhea and over 85% of extragenital chlamydia. These are data from the same study showing that 74% of pharyngeal gonorrhea was detected in the absence of a positive urethral test. Similarly, 72% of rectal gonorrhea was detected in the absence of a positive urethral test. And 88% of rectal chlamydia was detected in the absence of a positive urine test. OK, so that's extragenital testing in HIV negative MSM. How are we doing screening for STDs in HIV positive MSM? And the answer is also not very well. We do relatively well looking for syphilis, over 50% uh, based on chart review of patients were tested for syphilis at their last appointment. However, 20% were tested for chlamydia or gonorrhea. You can sort of imagine a reason why. Testing for syphilis is very straightforward. It's a blood test. You add it to your other panel of blood tests. Testing for gonorrhea or chlamydia, particularly extragenital gonorrhea or chlamydia, requires a swab, which can be time consuming and potentially uncomfortable for both providers and patients. We know that one thing you can do to make this easier is to allow patients to swab themselves. And we know that this is very, very acceptable to patients and has similar performance characteristics compared to clinician swabs. So you can have patients swab themselves in the bathroom. You can have patients swab themselves in the exam room before you walk in. You can even take it out of the clinic and have patients swab themselves at the lab in a bathroom. And in any of those cases, patients can deposit the swabs at the laboratory for processing. One thing you can do even further to improve rates of extragenital screening is to program standing orders into your electronic medical record so that you don't even have to physically order the test each time you want it done. The, or, the standing orders are there. The patient can pick up a screening kit, self-swab, and drop off their samples at the lab. OK, so now a word about treatment. So these are the chlamydia treatment guidelines for adolescents and adults in non-pregnant adolescents and adults. A gram of azithromycin orally times one, or 100 milligrams of doxycycline twice a day for seven days. For pregnant adolescents and adults, it's really just azithromycin one gram orally. And the previous alternative re recommendation of amoxicillin has been dropped. One other important point is you don't want to retest for chlamydia less than three weeks after a positive chlamydia test, because you'll have a false positive result based on the persistence of non-viable organism DNA. Changes in the chlamydia treatment recommendations in 2015 included a new alternative regimen for non-pregnant patients, namely long-acting doxycycline, 200 milligrams once a day for seven days. The advantage is reduced pill burden. Uh, it's just as effective. It has a lower frequency of GI side effects. The disadvantage is that it's expensive. OK, what about proctitis? No real changes. 
the standard treatment for proctitis is 250 milligrams of ceftriaxone intramuscularly times one, plus doxycycline, 100 milligrams twice a day for seven days. If you suspect lymphogranuloma venereum, uh, someone has bloody proctitis, mucosal ulcers, you want to extend the period of treatment of doxycycline to three weeks. Okay, so we're going to talk about gonorrhea treatment. We have to talk a little bit about emerging resistance to cephalosporins in gonorrhea. So these are data from the gonorrhea isolate surveillance program in California. This is looking at rates of resistance to cephalosporins, specifically cefixime in orange and ceftriaxone in red over time. You can see there was a bit of a spike in 2009, 2010. That's come down a bit, but this is still of concern. We don't want this organism to become resistant to cephalosporins. This is also data from the gonorrhea isolate surveillance program looking at susceptibility to other antibiotics, namely penicillins, tetracyclines, and quinolones. You can see that 60% of gonorrhea isolates were sensitive to all three classes. However, rates of resistance to uh, penicillins were about 4.4%, to tetracyclines about 11%, to quinolones 7%, and then most concerningly, between 2 and 6% of isolates were resistant to multiple classes of these antibiotics. So this leads to the current recommendations for treating gonorrhea, which are 250 milligrams of ceftriaxone intramuscularly times one, plus one gram of azithromycin PO times one. And you'll notice that doxycycline has been dropped as an alternative to azithromycin based on these increasing rates of tetracycline resistance. Okay, so what about treatment alternatives for patients with gonorrhea? So for anogenital infections, you can use an oral cephalosporin, cefixime 400 milligrams once a day, plus a gram of azithromycin. And in case of severe allergy to penicillins or cephalosporins, whereas we used to use two grams of azithromycin orally once, that recommendation is changing. So now the alternatives for severe allergy are gentamicin, 240 milligrams IM, plus two grams of azithromycin, or gemifloxacin, 320 milligrams orally, plus two grams of azithromycin. You'll note that doxycycline has been removed uh, as co-treatment uh, unless there is known azithromycin allergy, which is very rare. Okay, so what about test of cure? Who needs a test of cure after gonorrhea treatment? So anyone with pharyngeal gonorrhea treated with an alternative regimen, anyone who is suspected of having treatment failure, and we're gonna get to that in a minute, and then anyone treated using a non-recommended or non-standard monotherapy. So what is suspected cephalosporin treatment failure? This is the persistence of gonorrhea despite appropriate cephalosporin treatment in someone who's at low risk for reinfection. And I say that because most cases of quote unquote persistent gonorrhea are actually cases of reinfection, not cases of drug resistance or treatment failure. However, you should suspect treatment failure if someone remains symptomatic for three to five days after treatment, if they have a positive culture for gonorrhea more than 72 hours after treatment, or if they have a positive NAT for gonorrhea more than seven days after treatment. So the first thing you do if you suspect antibiotic resistance in gonorrhea is collect specimens for repeat NAT testing and for culture. You can ask the lab to do a disc diffusion e-test or an agar dilution to look for drug resistance. You also want to notify your local public health lab and the CDC and collect isolates to send to both those places for additional testing. Your first step is to retreat using the standard first-line therapy, which is ceftriaxone plus azithromycin, particularly if you suspect reinfection rather than resistance. If that doesn't work or you have a strong suspicion for resistance, then you want to use one of the two alternative regimens, namely intramuscular genomycin plus two grams of azithromycin or oral gemifloxacin plus two grams of azithromycin. So back to Jeremy, feeling well, here for his annual checkup, 
It turns out he's had four male partners in the last three months, some with condoms, some without. Uh, you decide to do three-site NAT testing and to talk to him about pre-exposure prophylaxis or PrEP. So I'd like to thank my colleagues Ina Park and Stephanie Cohen for their wisdom and for some of their slides. Uh, hope this was useful and thanks for listening.